Humanity and Technology, as the subtitle indicates, is a public conversation about the world we make and what it means. Our mission is to bring uh, leading hum humanities scholars and uh, creative writers and artists and intellectuals to campus to talk about different aspects of technology as it uh, shapes our lives. Uh, and this particular event is part of what I hope will continue to be an ongoing series where we think about um, science fiction as one of the great intersections of humanity and technology. Um, so I'm glad you're here for this conversation. We have many wonderful sponsors and collaborators. Um, I'm particularly grateful uh, for the um, uh, Marburger STEM Center, which has co-sponsored this event. Um, Dr. Collins is the director of the Marburger STEM, uh, STEM Center, so thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, we also have support from the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Architecture and Design, uh, the Southfield Public Library, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Teagle Foundation, people love us, isn't this great? Uh, and most recently, the Michigan Humanities Council, uh, which has sponsored um, our work this year uh, and for which we are very grateful. Uh, as a quick announcement, our next event is a collaboration with the College of Architecture and Design. Uh, we are having Ginger Nolan, who is uh, Assistant Professor of Architectural History and Urbanism from the University of Southern California here on November 7th at 6 p.m. and um, Dr. Nolan's work is sort of at the intersection of post-colonial studies and architectural theory. So I think that her talk is going to be quite engaging and I hope that you can join us for that. Today's panel is dedicated to Octavia Butler's Kindred. And given the fact that um, I know that some people in the audience may not have read uh, Butler before, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time um, giving you a little bit more background on her and also a quick not even spark notes quality sketch of the book, uh, just so people have a sense of the plot. Uh, that will allow you, I think, to participate in the panel a little more robustly and hopefully uh, intrigue you to uh, pick up Butler yourself and spend some time reading her. So what I'm gonna do is give uh, that, this overview and then I'm going to introduce our panelists and have them join us on stage and we will uh, pick it up from there. So here's a photo of Octavia Butler and I'm grateful to the estate of Octavia Butler which has helped support this event um, and they shared this photograph of her and also uh, this biographical sketch which I'm going to read to give you a sense of, of who she is and, and her work. So Octavia E. Butler was a renowned African-American author who received a MacArthur Genius Grant and Penn West Lifetime Achievement Award for her body of work. And I just read recently, I believe she was the first MacArthur recipient in science fiction. Uh, so, I mean, it, that's quite an accomplishment. Born in Pasadena in 1947, she was raised by her mother and her grandmother. She was the author of several award-winning novels, including Parable of the Sower from 1993, which was a New York Times notable book of the year, and Parable of the Talents, 1995, winner of the Nebula Award for the best science fiction novel published that year. She was acclaimed for her lean prose, strong protagonists, and social observations in stories that range from the distant past to the far future. Uh, though the MacArthur Grant made life easier in later years, she struggled for decades with her dystopian novels exploring themes of black injustice, global warming, women's rights, and political disparity were, to say the least, uh, I'm sorry, I misread that sentence. Um, because her dystopian novels exploring themes of black injustice, global warming, women's rights, and political disparity were, to say the least, not in commercial demand, although looking at our world today, we can see how prescient they were. During these years of obscurity, Butler, always an early riser, woke at 2 a.m. every day to write, and then went to work as a telemarketer, potato chip inspector, and dishwasher, among other things. So you have no excuses when you don't turn that paper in on time. She passed away on February 24th, 2006, far too soon. At the time of her death, interest in her books was beginning to rise, and in recent years, sales of her books have, incre have increased enormously as the issues she addressed in her Afrofuturistic feminist novels and short fiction have only become more relevant. Her work is now taught in over 200 colleges and universities nationwide. The, New York, the number one New York Times bestselling graphic novel adaptation of her book, Kindred, which is today's panel uh, topic, created by Damian Duffy and John Jennings, received the Eisner Award for Best Adaptation. And I'm actually now going to turn to a brief, very brief plot summary of Kindred for those of you who haven't read it. This is the, um, the, the, the cover of the first edition of the novel published in 1979, but I am going to draw on images from the recent graphic, graphic novel adaptation, which I think was uh, quite good. 
although I think you should really read both texts. They both do very, very different things. It, it's a true adaptation in that sense. Um, so the brief plot summary. Uh, Dana, our narrator and main character, is a writer living in Los Angeles with her husband, Kevin. The year is 1976, which is about three years before the book was published. And Dana and Kevin have just moved to a new house in the suburbs when Dana suddenly and mysteriously finds herself spontaneously transported through time and space. Uh, her first experience places her at the side of a river where she saves a child from drowning, and she's uh, quickly brought back uh, to the present moment soon after doing this. Um, and like many time travel narratives, the time sequence is off, uh, off kilter. So a very short amount of time in the present counts for more time in the past, right? This is, this is kind of a conventional. I'd love to hear the, phys the physicists talk about why that might be the case, but when, when, when Dana leaves for a few seconds in, uh, in 1976, uh, a few hours may pass in, uh, in uh, the early 19th century, in, 18, uh, in the early 1800s, which is when she, she discovers where she's being transported. So she soon figures out that her travels back in time correspond, correspond to threats on Rufus Whalen's life. And Rufus Whalen is the young boy who's in the river here. Um, she is protecting Rufus uh, until she can, till he can become the father of Hager Whalen, who is one of um, Dana's ancestors. So she realizes that Rufus is also part of her ancestry, and she's going back in time at these moments when he has threats upon his life and is saving him. Uh, Rufus Whalen is, however, the son of a plantation owner. So what ends up happening is that as she's traveling back to the plantation, Dana is getting a firsthand encounter of plantation life and also developing relationships with many of the people who, who are there, including the plantation owners as well as uh, the fellow slaves uh, that she encounters, including her, her other ancestor, Alice Greenwood, who's pictured here uh, in the left. Um, so the bulk of the novel um, really, I think, is, is exploring these different kinds of relationships and also Dana's efforts to intervene and protect or improve the lives of the people that she's encountering. And I, I, one big element of the plot is her intervention in Rufus's life because Rufus's father, Tom Whalen, is a uh, strict, violent slave plantation owner. And so early on, Dana's you know, struggling with the idea of can I change Rufus's path? Can I make him uh, something other than his father? Um, but as Rufus grows older, uh, the violence escalates. I won't go into spoiler alerts here. And at the end of the novel, um, Dana finally returns uh, to the present, but she has lost an arm. This is not a spoiler because actually the text begins with Dana having lost her arm. So that's all the plot summary I'm going to give for the text. Um, I think more details will come out as we have our conversations. Um, and obviously, I'm only giving you the barest of thumbnail sketch. But this gives you some coordinates for understanding uh, our conversation today. For now, what I'm going to do is invite our panelists uh, up to, the, to um, the mic after I give their biographies. And then uh, what I've asked them to do is start uh, with a brief response to the question, what does, Octavia's Butler, what does Octavia Butler's kindred mean for me and my work? Um, that will take probably about uh, 25 to 30 minutes. We'll hear from them. We'll have them dialogue a little bit. And then I really would like to open up the floor to all of you so that we can uh, start um, engaging and having a public conversation here. So our first panelist is Lisa Zay Winters. Uh, Lisa, uh, Dr. Winters is an associate professor in the departments of African American Studies and English at Wayne State University. She is the author of The Mulata Concubine, Terror, Intimacy, Freedom, and Desire in the Black Transatlantic, which was published in 2016 by the University of Georgia Press for their Race in the Atlantic World 1700 to 1900 series. Her current research project looks at how representations of enslaved motherhood intersect with notions of the fantastic in African American literature. Yolanda Jack is uh, an actress, stage manager, and director of theater. A native Detroiter, Yolanda returned home after 10 years on the East Coast to begin a family and to found One World Theater Company with her husband, Philip Jack. While pursuing theatrical ambitions, Yolanda works as an educator and the youth program coordinator at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Our third panelist is Kim Hunter. 
Kim Hunter is the author of the fiction collection, The Official Report on Human Activity, published by Wayne State University Press in 2018, and winner of the 2018 Indie Silver Award for Short Stories. It's a really excellent book. I highly recommend it. The book's manuscript earned him a Kresge Literary Arts Fellowship in 2012. Kim Hunter is a Detroiter employed in media relations for social justice groups. He co-directed the Woodward Line Poetry Series for 13 years, which earned Knight's Art Challenge Detroit in 2013. His poems appear in a variety of journals, and he has published two collections of poetry, Edge of the Times, Time Zone, published by White Print, Inc. in 2009, and Born on Slow Knives, Past Tense, 2001. As the panelists come to the po um, stage, please join me in welcoming them and thanking them for visiting us here at LTU. Excellent. So here we are. So um, Lisa, I guess we'll start with you. Great. Thank you. Um, and I just want to thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm really excited to be up here with you all um, and looking forward to this conversation. So I'm going to do my best to kind of talk my comments, but I type them so I can stay on track and stay within my um, time limit here. So what does kindred mean to me in my field? Um, Octavia Butler. Um, the author means so much to my field, period, and Kindred is something special, but so are all of her novels. Um, and she means so much to my field, but she also means so much to me. And her work is the reason I chose to pursue a PhD in the first place. So these things are hard to separate, but I think that it's this tension between the rigor of her craft and her work's deeply emotional resonance. Um, that's exactly why her work is so important to the field. And here, it's probably important to clarify my field because I'm not trained in English. I, my degrees are all in African American studies. Um, and so when I say that, um, I say that because kindred means different things depending on where you stand in the academic field of literary studies. So the context is we know that Octavia Butler was a fiction, science fiction writer. Kindred is a, her fourth novel and comes after three novels that were much more identifiably within the genre. Um, of science fiction and fantasy. Um, and it's also important that, you know, publishers were afraid that there wasn't an African American market for science fiction. Because when Octavia Butler um, was writing science fiction, it was basically um, she and Samuel Delaney. Um, and so the first three books, the initial, um, the initial editions of our first three books featured either white people or extraterrestrial aliens and didn't represent the black characters that were central to her books. Um, and then when she decides to write Kindred, she can't find a publisher for the book because science fiction, you know, publishers don't know what to do with this book. Um, so they couldn't imagine a science fiction novel that was set in the antebellum South where slavery was historical and very real and not just a stand in for something else. It wasn't, it didn't operate metaphorically or allegorically um, exclusively. So if we know all this and we can understand for the field of science fiction studies, right, Kindred is important because it introduces this whole history into the genre of science fiction. Um, so they didn't want to publish it and then Kindred becomes her most popular book. So um, it makes sense that it is because in a lot of ways it's her most accessible book, especially if you're not a fan of science fiction. Um, it's also one of her only standalone, it's one of two standalone books in a corpus otherwise full of series that takes us on journeys into the future and into space. And some people categorize her last book as um, a standalone book, but she was planning on writing more about um, vampires. So in that way, Kindred really is like unique in her body of, um, of work. Um, <clears throat> so you can pick Kindred up and read it, and when it's done, you can move on to our other works, and you should, but you can also pick up and read Kindred, and if you're reading it from the field of African American studies, then you read it and it makes you rethink everything about slavery and its legacy in the present day, and it also gives you fresh insight into how we read African American literature in the first place. So because of its story, the plot um, that Dr. Janssen um, 
thank you for that yeah. quick, <laughs> very quick. Um, that <laughs> saves me some work. So because it's so specifically and explicitly concerned with the legacy of slavery um, in the US, the book is also important in my field because of the way it can be read and taught along with other works by black authors. So on one hand, Kindred is really important because it's one of the earliest contemporary novels of slavery or neo-slavery. So during the 19th century, you have a genre, 19th century slave narratives written by fugitive um, slaves. And then late in the 20th century, you see novels um, that are explicitly kind of reimagining slavery um, and uh, I don't want to say reimagining it. And, and, and we can talk, I'll put that kind of on the table for discussion there, all right? Um, so, but if we, um, it's, a, it's a contemporary novel that is kind of right at the beginning of this explosion of contemporary and neo-slave um, narratives, and it also unsettles readers of other slave narr narratives and neo-slave narratives because what Kindred does that I think is really important in terms of his intervention, one of his many interventions, is it considers the humanity of the slaveholders along with that of the enslaved. Um, and I think that's why it used to be my least favorite novel. So I discovered Octavia Butler when I was a college student, um, and I read her Patternist series first, I read um, the Xenogenesis series next, and these are really science fiction, like solidly science fiction novels. And then I read Kindred, and I was like, eh. And I think part of it is because it's uncomfortable, because it really, presents a different kind of idea of resistance. Um, and I want to be clear here, right, that the novel is not in any way sympathetic to slavery or slaveholders. Um, so, but rereading it and revisiting it um, in the works of other scholars certainly has helped me to see how Kindred considers the full spectrum of humanity really to get at a deeper and more complex understanding of the enslaved humanity, right, to get at questions of what resistance did and could look like, and why and how accommodation could be necessary just to survive. And so this is part of one huge thing that Kindred needs to the field, right, is to get at some questions about resistance and power struggles, personal desires, and the cost of all that, um, especially when we live in a nation so shaped by its legacy of slavery. And the other way, and perhaps this is a more academic way, but I'm the academic up here, mm -hmm. so, um, but it, this work and even the categorization of books in terms of genre and legitimacy are so much about what it means to be human. And so what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that it matters that Kindred is so different from most of her other work and it's the specificity of the novel's content that makes it so easy to place alongside other works. But then once you place Kindred within the canon of African American literature, then what that does is invite you to think about how and where we see science fiction and speculative work um, within that same canon where we might not otherwise see it, right? So Kindred stands out not, um, stands out but it's not an anomaly for Butler and that there's this actually very, a, a very deep tradition in African American letters of science fiction and speculative writing, but somehow we weren't really seeing or framing that tradition as such until we placed Butler into that canon. Um, and Kindred has allowed and invited s scholars to look back through the corpus of African American literature and rediscover how black writers have always used the fantastic in science fiction to imagine new possibilities. And again, it's focus on slavery, on the strangeness and surreal but real horror of, of chattel slavery, of how chattel slavery produced alienated subjects also invites us to rethink the deeply speculative work of any black writing, but especially that of the antebellum period. So when we read Kindred in terms of a black fantastic or science fiction novel of slavery, um, I also ask my students when I'm teaching the novel to consider how might Kindred get us to think and understand how African American writers in the antebellum period who dared to imagine the abolition of slavery weren't also doing the same deeply spe speculative and fantastical writing. Mm -hmm. so. Wow, thank you. Um, again, I'm so honored to be sitting here. Um, I am neither an academic nor a writer, so uh, I'm an educator at the Charles H. Wright Museum, and so I come, I think, from an experiential point of view. Um, the book, um, when I read it years ago, um, hit me, you know, hard. And it was a visceral, like my body, I felt it in my body. And when I bring groups like yours, your class would have 
been a group that has gone through the Charles Wright Museum's exhibitions, and et cetera. When I'm bringing th groups through the core, the main exhibition of And Still We Rise, where we deal with slavery, um, myself and the groups walk through this experience where you are placed experientially in enslavement, perhaps as a witness, but often as uh, in the way that the book deals with it, and not so close to Dana, but we are participants. Mm -hmm. You feel, how would you be if it were me? And I hear that often when I bring people through the museum. So I think the reason why I'm sitting here is to speak about the experience of it and, and how it relates to how regular people walk this planet. Um, being that I'm a performer, it is important to me to understand the psychology of an individual who I'm portraying. What makes a person think a certain way? How would they, why would they respond in this way? So similarly, as I read through the book, and then the funny thing, I, I thought I had a copy of this in my house to remind myself, you know, I was gonna be prepared and you know, have my thing together, and I didn't have a book. So I had to go find it, right? So, um, and it was Friday afternoon when I discovered I did not have the book. <laughs> Today is the panel. So I was stressed out, I went to find the book. Um, the library didn't have it, so now I gotta buy it, no problem. I go to buy the book on Friday afternoon after I leave work. I come home thinking I'm just gonna, you know, glance through it and just to kind of remind myself of what's happened. I stayed up until Saturday morning and I finished the novel. You know, I started, you know, I don't know, whatever time I got home. And then at 6.30 or whatever it was, when my husband was waking up, and getting ready for his day, uh, he's like, babe, what you doing? I'm like, this book. Mm -hmm. And that really was what happened mm -hmm. to Dana um, in the book, the character, she was sucked in, literally sucked out of her time and into a new time as I was sucked into this story, which was being beautifully, brutally, and I think in many ways, very honestly, because of the research that uh, Octavia Butler did, to bring this book to us. She studied and read and, 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 and did work, serious scholastic work, on what was slavery like, not only for those who were enslaved, but for the enslavers. What was the life of an enslaver? How did a man or a woman come to be an owner of people? And what's that process? How do you, how does, how do you make that okay in your brain? to be an owner of a person. And so understanding, like beginning to have a foundation of understanding that, which is an alien concept to people in a modern United States of America, right? We come to the world thinking the land of the free, the home of the brave, but yeah, in 18 anything, the land of the free. Asterix. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and, and being a person who works in a historical museum of African American history, the point of view, I'm t I don't believe I'm telling black history. Let's start there. I believe I'm telling history. American history, world history, fill in the blank. So understanding the historical context of what the United States was founded on. Before the United States was the United States, there were, there were laws that were rules established as to who was and was not enslaved. The rule was, if the woman who gave birth to that child, if she were enslaved, that child would forever be enslaved. That child was property. If she were a free woman, as some of the people who have read this book know, the children who were born to a free woman were not to be enslaved. They could be, they might be, but they were still allowed to live their lives as free individuals at some point. It might be more like um, indentured servitude in their lives. So this is in 1662 when that rule was established in Virginia. The United States wasn't the United States. These were just colonies. So even prior to the writing of the Constitution, even prior to any of the laws that we know that govern our land to make us the amazing United States of America, the idea of enslavement and the protection of people as property was well woven into the fabric of these United States of America. So when I read this book and understood that, it was real clear to me 
that there's a real mindset that you have to have when you walk into this world as Dana did. And she was not a stupid woman, she was a writer. She had studied, she had read, she learned a few things in school. I mean, we're 400 years, we're celebrating the 400th anniversary of the first Africans to be enslaved in the United States this year, 2019 is 400 years after the first Africans were brought to Virginia to be enslaved. So I think it's really important that we're having this conversation. The context, the framework is very important now, I think. But all of that being said, she understood the significance of this thing, slavery, in the United States, and how a person in 1976, the 200th anniversary of the country, would appreciate independence versus enslavement. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the importance of this story, what it means um, is, is as layered and as nuanced as what Dr. Zay Winters mentioned, but from the experiential point of view, because walking these streets, walking the blocks as a black woman, as a mother, as a wife, as a child when I was a youth, how did that experience make me who I am? As a person who was enslaved, Dana lived her life as an enslaved person when she went back to the antebellum South, when she went to Maryland. She was enslaved, as free as she was in 1976, and it didn't matter. Because in Maryland, in 18 anything, you black, you enslaved. Why you talk like that? Why do you know these things? How is it that you're bringing, so she was an alien in her own mm -hmm. way in the worlds that she, that she was being injected into. So she was the other, mm -hmm. while she was the same mm -hmm. as enslaved people, So because she was able to understand um, their point of view, or she thought she could, until she began to really, really further get, each time she went back to say, poor Rufus, There's a whole conversation on Rufus, right? <laughs> um, every time she went back to save him, she spent more time. And she would physically be marked each time. First time she came back, she was marked by the water and the mud. The next time she came back, she was physically scarred. And each time, the physical scars got worse and heavier and harder, in many cases, the, one of the visits, I don't remember which one it was, I think there were six visits that she went to Antebellum South. She was not able to heal properly from the pr last time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as Dr. Paul mentions, may I call you Dr. Paul? Sorry. You can just call me Paul. Um, as he mentioned, you know, going back and forth, she's spending this time, she wasn't even healed properly from a previous time. And they're looking at her like, how aren't you healed? That was years ago. No, that was moments ago for her. <laughs> and so here we are in 2019 looking at enslavement through this lens of 400 years. Is it really 400 years or is it today? Are we still wrestling with the issues of enslavement? Yes, of course we are. Because we're still dealing with the ways that the laws were written. We were still dealing, we're still dealing today, just recently, just last week, week before, how the police deal with people of African descent versus people of European or Asian descent. We're still today, it's 2019. My children don't know anything about life without cell phones, 24 hour society. How many of us remember when TV went off? Right? You shut up and went to sleep. <laughs> There was no lights in the antebellum South. She walked into a world where it was pitch black and she didn't know if it was sunrise or sunset. So understanding the different worlds that you fall into, how that world was created, impacts the future, the current, and obviously it colors the past. So to me, the series or the story that is told in the series, and like you, I came to or Octavia Butler through the Patternist series. If y'all read Octavia Butler, man, y'all need to get in there. The woman is amazing. But, because uh, her, her stories are so compelling. They're so full, they're so rich. They're action packed and filled with love and brutal honesty and give you a place to give a vision or, or a perspective on something that we think we know. 
but in a way that we're really reintroduced to something that may seem very familiar to us. When we know this history, we know American history, we know slavery history, we've been taught it. No, actually we haven't. And also, no, we don't know how it would be if we were in it. We don't understand that experience because we've not lived it. But through this book, it gives us an opportunity to see how a modern person, both a woman and a man, Dana's husband goes, how they are impacted by the world that they are thrust into and then sucked out of and now they're in this deal. So that's, that's my appreciation for the impact, the experience, the understanding of life and how you try to navigate through this ex experience, this existence of walking the planet, literally trying to eat, trying to see. And that's for me. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, thanks again. I'm very glad to be here on this on this stage with all of you. And uh, I took the question of um, how does Butler affect my practice to mean I took it very selfishly to talk about my writing actually. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a technical technical considerations of her sentences, how much they differ from mine, and there's the broader thematic issues of my being a black writer of speculative fiction. The first technical issue is easy. She writes plainly and clearly and has mastered storytelling in a classic, tightly woven three-act mode with rising development and crisis. I write in a pseudo postmodern, self-conscious way with more questions than re resolutions. But on the more important thematic front, her influence or effect will be felt strongest later after I've had a chance to weave it in with some other fiction, uh, Colson, Whitehead, Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad, which I recently finished, George Schuyler's Black No More, which I am rereading, and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaiden's Tale, which I'm trying to get through. What I am likely to steal from Butler, and that's, wh that's what I'll be doing, I'll just be straight out stealing it, um, is what I've come to call the dream waking past present theme. In Kindred, the protagonist becomes dizzy, woozy when she's snatched back into the 19th century, which inspired me to think of her time travel into the so-called past as a sort of dream, and the waking being the time the protagonist was born into the book's present. In this case, the dream, more like a lucid marathon of a nightmare, is not only as real as the waking past, but has shaped not only as real as the waking present, but it has shaped the present in a way that Freud could have never considered. Of course, the past is not a dream, it's reality that is so far from the protagonist's material life that it seems unreal. Note that I said the protagonist's material life, not her social or political life. There is a social political gap, to be sure, between the period of legal slavery in the US and the celebrating of the U.S. Bicentennial in the 1970s. In fact, one of the book's ironies is that documentation or mention of that gap, i.e. progress made toward black liberation, is dangerous for Dana to be caught with. Only the material items, over-the-counter medicine in particular, from the 20th century, consistently help her. The map um, is a material thing, but it's, it's, conce it's conceptual. I mean, if she's caught with the map, if she's caught with a map of uh, the area, uh, for her to be a, caught with a map as a black woman is a dangerous thing because they think, oh, you're trying to get out, which of course is part of what she was doing. She does have a knife with her from the 20th century. I go back and forth on that. Could she have killed a white man and protected herself and fared better? It's questionable, probably not. Uh, just my male socialization wants me to think, oh yeah, she could kill this guy and get away with it, but probably not. Uh, hiding the body is hard even now. In any event, material versus ideas or help or hindrances is another thing I may find a, wind, may find a way to steal. For now though, I think the digital world versus the corporeal, quote unquote, real world is, is a theme that's already popped up in my work and may well, very well run a good parallel to the dream waking uh, that is in this book. And that's what I'm, uh, that's my reaction.
let's thank our panelists for these reflections. These were great. Uh, you all have spread out a plethora of things that we could pick up and talk about. So maybe we could just start. Is there anything that anybody else said in this conversation that you know, resonated, you wanted to hear more about? Maybe we can start there. And then I'd like to turn it over to our audience so they can chime in. But just curious if there's anything that well, jumped out. Well, the, um, the, the question of um, why, ha why aren't you healed, like that's that's, that is such a question that we get from uh, white folks that are not uh, tuned in to the reality of what it means to be a human being. And it's such a curious question for a country that prides itself on being based on the Greek ideals of democracy, et cetera, et cetera, but you don't want to deal with something that happened on your continent for hundreds of years and hasn't been gone that long and, and had to be uh, fought over, had to fight the most devastating war yet still this country has ever been in in order to deal with that, but somehow that's relegated to the past as to where the Greeks and the Romans, we're gonna, we wanna talk about that, that's cool. Mm. That's mm. a really bizarre way of thinking. I just had a conversation, was I, I do a podcast, and just had a conversation with Rochelle Riley about her book called The Burden which deals with the legacy of slavery as it stands today. And that book was inspired because there was a columnist that wrote something that, said, that basically told black people to get over it. Get over slavery, it happened a long time ago. So that question resonates, resonated with me a lot. The, you know, the, yeah. I think that to pick up where you took off, just left off there, the thing that was newer, newer to me was the understanding of this concept of the lost cause philosophy or the lost cause mindset which, you know, I think I would turn that question, you know, get over it, or that concept of get over it, to the people who came up with that concept of the lost cause. If you have never heard of it, the lost cause philosophy or thought is that the, for the people for, uh, from the South who lost the war, that it was a lost cause, that we couldn't, you know, whatever, and I don't understand the, it's the mindset. Ro it's romanticizing. It, it, yes, so the, the heroes, the people who were the generals, the warriors who were the lead, uh, they were the heroes of the Southern Rebellion. And there's no, you know, so th they became the people who were the heroes as opposed to the villains. And the concept of how we learn um, the Civil War or slavery in the United States today, to a great extent now, we don't talk about the fact that slavery was the point of the Civil War. We talk about it being industry versus, you know, the industrialized North versus the antiquated agricultural South, or, you know, they were backward or whatever. No, 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 let's be clear. It was slavery and the point of slavery. Why was it so important? Because that's what made the South rich. That's what how made the United States, that's how the United States became as bad and bold as we became. Because of the wealth of cotton and sugar and indigo and rice grown by people who were not getting paid. If you had to pay somebody to do half of what those men and women who were enslaved were doing, the United States would never have gotten to the point that we did in the 18s, 1800s, or even in the 1900s perhaps because this, you just wouldn't have that kind of wealth being distributed. So that mindset of get over it, well, I could say that to the people of the Confederacy, get over it, y'all lost. But they didn't get over it. We haven't gotten over it. We've not, been re we've not reconciled ourselves because we, we don't talk about the truth. We don't speak about what happened for real, how slavery was, we talk about Harriet Tubman and, Fre and Frederick Douglass, why were they trying to escape? Mm. If slavery was so cool, if it was really not so bad, why were people literally risking their lives? Why would somebody pay somebody else after he built a crate big enough for him, pay somebody else to seal him up in that crate to ship him to freedom? Henry Box Brown. I had to trust, if I were Henry Brown, that the person was putting me on the right boat mm -hmm. or on the right wagon. I had to put my life in somebody else's hands to find the potential of freedom. It wasn't guaranteed. So the idea of experience really is really where I'm, I have to keep going back to. So, and the other thing that 
Dana's husband in the book is a white man. I think we were polite about that. We didn't talk about that, but that's an issue that they confront immediately. Because mm -hmm. she knows if he were to come here, I probably would be more comfortable, more safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to a degree, she was until they got separated. Mm -hmm. And so now we have to really begin to see how this mindset of enslavement impacted him. Because she, they were separated so tough to when she got transported back to the modern time in the book, he got left behind mm -hmm. in the Etabellum South for eight days. So she was here in 1976, here in the present, and he was back, and it had been five years. What does five years on a white person or any person in the days of enslavement do? How does that inform how you think, how you navigate the planet, literally? If I'm a black woman stuck in any time during the slavery, everybody knows what I'm doing. Everybody knows what my life is like. But as a white man, I have some options. I got some ability, I can own land. He was about to buy a farm. Mm -hmm. He was able to get jobs. He was able to keep himself whole and safe. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how whole and safe he felt though. I don't think he felt safe. Because mm -hmm. I think he be. actually had P PTSD when he came back. He should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, and but that was because he come from the he come from the present. It wasn't because had he, been a, had he been a regular had he been a regular white guy, he wouldn't have that wouldn't have. He would have fallen in and been right. right okay, yeah. you say regular. Because well, I mean, <laughs> it's you know there were there were John Browns, but um, it was generally it was it was more traumatic because he would come from a place where he didn't have to consider these things right. so deeply before. I, I think that that's part of it, right? Like the, what the trauma looks like is just different. It's not that he wasn't traumatized or it's not that, and I think that that's part of what Kindred does, right? In terms of like looking, tracing Rufus. So we see Rufus grow from, you know, this, this kid. And like you said, you know, the way that he's treated by his father is one thing. And then what slavery does to him. And, and you see this in the 19th century slave narratives. This was like one, one aspect of what like someone like Douglas or Jacobs like made it, made it clear to their reader. like. Slavery is as bad for white people. I, that's too flat. Slavery is also bad for white people, mm -hmm, right? right? And slavery damages white people. They retain privilege, right? So it's not it's it, it's not that you know um, they are they don't you know that they suffer absolutely. But I think that that's part of what Kindred does. And, and again, I think that was part of you know especially when we think about like when when Kindred appears in. 1979, thank you, <laughs> um, and, and kind of where, you know, where black culture was in terms of kind of thinking like on, the, you know, in the wake of the black power movement and mm -hmm. kind of thinking and recovering stories of slavery. Um, and so it's a big deal for her to portray Rufus as somewhat sympathetic, even as you see his inevitable, inevitable kind of destruction of his soul, right? Like that there's something, and, and I think that that's part of what she's working through. And like I said, for me, when I read it, I think that was, so by the time I read Kindred, I had, I mean, I was an African-American studies major, so I already read The Slave, and I, like I had encountered slavery kind of like through a, a historical lens. And I also, I mean, just give away my age, right? But I also read Kindred, like I think, either right before X came, Malcolm X came out, like Spike Lee. So it was like whenever he was wearing like the medallions oh, and like, yeah, so it was yeah. just very kind of, you know, so there was this very kind of like post 60s, like nationalist, you know, like oh, if I had been, you know, if I'd been enslaved, you know, if I'd been a slave, I wouldn't have, you know, let them do this or whatever. So I think that that's part of the, the, the what the novel is grappling with is not to, and this is why I was like, it's not that she is at all sympathetic to slavery as an institution, but she's kind of thinking through like what happens to everybody, right? So I would love to open up to some conversation and questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And what we have is we have mic people, <laughs> mic carriers, not mic droppers. Uh, here, who are going to give you a mic. And the mic is important because uh, we're recording this, and so this way we get the audio on the, the question and answer. Uh, while you are thinking about your question, raising your hand, I would just make what the, this conversation about getting over it and historical trauma, 
w the first thing I thought of was that's what makes it so genius that she starts and ends the book with the loss of the arm because there's a difference I think in terms of like one can't get over the loss of a limb the way you know what I mean like wh what one does is one adapts and lives with the loss of the limb right you know it's it's so there's this difference you know I broke my wrist 10 years ago it doesn't affect my life I, I have a healing process but there's this sense in which the you know that kind of I don't want to say disfigurement because it's too strong of a word, but there is, at least for the character, Dana, this like thing that, that you have to learn to cope with, right? Well, and that, to me, that just frames the conversation mm -hmm. differently in some ways. This is one of the things that um, Octavia Butler, in one of her interviews, she spoke about kind of where the book came from. Um, she talked about how her own childhood watching uh, when she would not be able to, when her mother couldn't afford or find a babysitter, she would go to work with her mother, who was a maid in white people's homes. This is, she was born in 47, I think it was, so this is in the 50s. So during a time when black people, uh, and at that time she watched her mother have to go into a back door um, only to be in the presence of the people who were talking about her as if she did not exist mm -hmm. and wasn't right there and be insulted by these men and women who were her bosses. And she spoke about how she remembers, you know, just, you know, I guess she was around, she said she was around seven or eight uh, years old, and she told her mother, I don't wanna do what you do. What you do is terrible. And she watched like that moment, I think I can only imagine if I had said something like that to my mother mm -hmm. and, or my father about their job and how crushed her mother became and how demeaned she was in front of her child by these people. How during the days of enslavement, the men couldn't protect their wives or daughters mm -hmm. from brutality that we don't even talk about in public mm -hmm. and polite conversations. Um, so she began to, I think, deal with this and even in her uh, college experience, she said what started the germ or what she got the idea for Kendrick from is from the people of the black power movement talking about the men and women who survived enslavement and who lived it, the quote unquote mammies and the Uncle mm -hmm. Toms and these characters that are now stereotypes in writing and film and television today. Um, this idea of how did they survive? You can't just you know jump up and beat everybody. You, and even in the, the graphic novel she speaks of and in the book, you can't whoop everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't kill everybody. It's a system, you have to kill the system. And so you gotta survive it mm -hmm. in order to be able to eradicate it. But you don't survive it without internalizing the brutality of it. You cannot, I mean, and, and I can only imagine what it was like to you know, we see movies and we see, if you saw Roots, I know I was made to, you know, telling on myself as a child when Roots came out, the original series in the 70s, not the reboot, um, last uh, few years ago. But how I sat down, it was a shock to me to see what that portrayal in 1970 was, 78, 79, around the same time the book came out, this portrayal of enslavement and the what was shocking to us then of the brutality is mild and polite in comparison to what we see in video games, let alone regular TV and film. So the brutality of the physical aspect of enslavement and how the people survived is an issue that we're still trying to wrap our brains around. How to get, how do we get, how do we think about ourselves in the future as free people when there's no way in the world we could see ourselves as free? Because when was freedom gonna come? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I think that the the injuries when you talk about like the brutality of slavery and thinking about her her losing her arm, right? I think that there's something, and, and there's this this isn't me. This is like other scholars in the field are just starting to kind of really start to think about like people who are disabled under slavery, right? So when we imagine mm -hmm. slavery, when we imagine the enslaved, we generally imagine like able-bodied people, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but able-bodied people are maybe typical, but they're not, you know, no. they're not the only ones, right? Mm -hmm. So to kind of think about like, how does the novel get us to kind of think about 
both on two levels, right? So literal, literal disability, right? And how and what does that mean to be like black and disabled under slavery or black and disabled in the contemporary moment, right? And then kind of the the trauma of slavery and how you carry that trauma um, in your body, even if it's in not visible ways, mm -hmm. right? And it disables so you in a different way. Yeah, wow. yeah. Mm -hmm. So much. All and right. You have Carrie, who was a, a mute. Exa exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's so interesting. Questions, feedback, love to hear. We have one arm back there and one arm up here, so we'll start back there and then we'll come up here. Where are our mics? There we go. Uh, no, no, you might need to turn on maybe a button at the bottom. I, oh, hello. Um, thank you, first of all. Um, so my question is kind of, uh, I'd love to gather your opinion. So I think when, when people do truly abhorrent, terrible things, like specifically in this case, like owning slavery, I think, or owning slaves rather, I think it's really easy to like dismiss the people who are responsible for these abhorrent behaviors as like they're, they're monsters and they're terrible and like you, you can't imagine that in especially in like contemporary times it's, it's almost impossible to imagine uh, as a few of you had alluded to that it's like you could ever be in that scenario yourself right where you where you would do something like that um, and I think that uh, we do ourselves a disservice to imagine that that's not just like a general flaw of humanity that that it's possible for anyone to like fall into these like traps of terrible, horrible behavior. Um, so in no way am I suggesting that we like sympathize or, mm. or like justify their behavior. Um, but my question is like, how do you suggest that we um, s sort of talk, walk the line of, of uh, recognizing that this is a flaw in humanity and so uh, we can, it, it helps so that it could never happen again and also to heal together, I suppose. Um, how do you suggest that we discuss that without justifying behavior or sympathizing or um, you know things like that? I think the first thing is to recognize, uh, I, I operate from a point of view of looking at systems, right? People operate within systems. And uh, what that means, one of the, one of the good things about um, even the sort of bourgeois democracy that we have is that it at least pays lip service to the idea that people are supposed to have control over the systems under which they live. Now, to make that true, in this country, there are a number of things that would have to happen on the economic front, things that happen to happen on the ethnic and racial and gender front in order to truly make that real. Um, it's a, it's a, it, it is a process of, in my day job, I do media for social justice groups. And I'm constantly telling them it's an issue of power, it's an issue of people getting together. We don't have money. When I say we, I'm talking about the people in this room. Uh, and the people, most of the people in this country are like the people in this room to some extent. And to, we're not billionaires, we're not millionaires. And the only way we can change things is, is by organizing. Right? But we can't, we have, the ways that we organize have to be different than the ways this country was made. Right, so we can't organize with the same sort of mindsets that got us into this problem in the first place. So that means taking leadership from women of color, that means taking leadership from the queer community, that means taking leadership from people who don't have money. That's the only way we're gonna really correct. I mean, it's not to say that people who, who have money and who are not queer and who are white or whatever and who are men don't have any part of it, yes. But the leadership has got to come from those people who are most oppressed. And, and marginalized, that's the one thing. But there's gotta be organization, on the ground, grassroots, if we wanna change anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, I t fully agree with what you said, and I would add um, some honest discussion, some, I mean, and, and to how to get to that, I think, would be required that we must honestly sit down with one another and confront the issues. Um, I, what comes to mind immediately is how after apartheid was over in South Africa, the truth and reconciliation um, um, sessions or, or court tribunals, I'm not sure of the right term, but they would, they would have time when the people who were involved, both as the Africans and the, Africaner, the Africaners, 
would be able to say what they did, how they were impacted, and then they could try to, you know, reach the middle somehow. As a person who has physical or economic or political or social uh, brutality inflicted upon me, I have to be able to speak to that hurt. As the inflictor, I, ha I have to be able to speak to how I was a part of that system so now we can begin to, so I can see how the person inflicting the pain or the problems or the political or social societal pressure could, you know, how did they get to that point? Now we can figure out how to move beyond it. And I think the other point um, being that I'm not a historian, but I became interested in history, working at a history museum, um, is reading our history. Um, Grandma told us, if you don't know your past, you're doomed to repeat it. And unless and until we understand there is not a culture on this planet that hasn't had some concept of uh, oppression, whether it is physical or economic or whatever, every culture has some sort of system that that was the case. The United States copied other countries. Other countries copied the United States, are copying the United States now. So we see that these issues are being replayed over and over again because we don't know our history well, and either we want to keep, you know, as some people say, MAGA, uh, make America great again, for whom? And um, where is that, is the greatness, is it, is it really, do we begin to uh, um, take that greatness and look at it and observe it and, and break it down? Is it really the kind of greatness that we want, or is there a different level of greatness that we're trying to arrive at? I would make one quick comment, read Octavia Butler, because it came up already, the character of Rufus, for example, is exactly what you describe, and she's struggling with the character, she's writing the character, Dana's struggling with the character. I mean, I think it's, it's one of the powers of this kind of speculative science fictional mm -hmm. mode that it allows us access in ways that we might not have otherwise, I think. So it's, I would just throw that in there. Yeah, the he well, you, you just reminded me, and, and when you were speaking, I mean, there are a lot of social justice activists that are actually using Octavia Butler's work, right, in terms of kind of modes of like reparative or restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's a really important and interesting, and I don't know, um, maybe you have more to say about that, but that's something that... No, I was just going to say, if there are any writers in the room, the tightness of this book is incredible mm -hmm. to use as a model. And part of the tightness is that relationships between the black people and the white people, the slaveholders and the, and the enslaved, uh, the, 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 there's a mirror, you know, a very obvious mirror between uh, Dana and Kevin mm -hmm. and Dana and Rufus. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so there's, there's Dana and Kevin, who are the married interracial couple from the 20th century. And then there's Rufus and Mary, is her name? Um, Alice. Alice, I'm sorry. Rufus and, uh, and Alice. Rufus is, uh, is in love with Alice. He can't really, he doesn't really come to terms with it. But there, but there are the parallels between these two interracial couples and how, they, and how they sort of relate to each other and don't relate to one another. Mm -hmm. And there's an incredible amount of humanity uh, in the midst of all of that. The conversations between um, uh, Dana and Rufus mm -hmm. are just, they're, they're, they are so deep and they're so simple. That's one of the amazing things about this woman as a writer, is she, can, she reminds me of Lucille Clifton, completely mm -hmm. plain spoken, yes. but layered, 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 many, many, it take you years to get through the layers of what's, what's going on there. So um, the, 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 the characters here are all very, very human, all very three-dimensional and very worth plumbing into if you want to get into some insight of, of not just slavery, but the legacy of slavery. We had a question down here. We get the mic real quick, and then we can. So I got one question is, uh, why, why is it that the victim has to like start the healing process? So like throughout the whole book, Dana is always forgiving Rufus for his actions. And it's even prevalent today, because even last week, you had the uh, uh, man's brother 
who would like ask the judge, hey, can I hug her? And he was the one that like started that like process. So wh why is that? Hmm. Hmm. First, I just want to say I love that question, yes. and the, and um, and I think that that question you, you've read the novel. Yeah. That so I feel like you asked that question because you've read that novel, right? I feel like Octavia, like that's part of what Kindred um, en enables, right, for us to kind of see something that seems otherwise so like like it's totally normalized, right? It's totally like you know, especially I mean, if you think about how it works in terms of race, how it works in terms of gender. And um, honestly, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to talk about the example you're bringing up because it's just, it's just a lot to, to see that. But I think that there's something about, you know, the things that we just kind of um, normalize in terms of who has to, you know, who needs to apologize, who needs to, you know, make other people feel comfortable in their own, you know, um, aggression. Um, Yeah, I don't have an answer of why, except that that's how it is, but then the work is to undo that. So if, if by healing, pro wh what do you mean by the healing process? Like a way of forgiveness to kind of like apologize and kind of like. To say things, just to like, why is she back there? Is it to well, she's, she, So that's an important point of the whole piece. She's back there because if she doesn't, and this is, this is why time travel doesn't happen, especially you can't go back. You can, mm -hmm. you, you could possibly go forward with a huge ball that weighs more than the sun, but that's another thing. So the reason that the reason that time travel is not one of the reasons that time travel is not possible is because she's going back there not to save him; she's going back there to save herself. It's like if you've seen the story Back Back to the Future, which I think this probably stole stole from this. Mm -hmm. So if, unless she goes back there and saves Rufus, she doesn't exist. He is, a, he, is a, he is a relative of hers, right? So it's really, it, it impugns the, the entire system of slavery again. We get back to systems. So that's why she has to go, I mean, if, 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 if what you mean by forgiving is like saving him, that's because she has to or she won't exist. Um, Let's go ahead. Let's just get the mic so we can get the, get the audio real quick. This is a wonderful panel. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, first of all, there was an article I just read. It was posted on Facebook, and I cannot tell you who wrote it, but it was a minister who's a former police policewoman, and she talked about that very incident with the, the hugging in the courtroom, and she used the term false grace, and it, it's a phenomena that she labeled, and it was fascinating. Can you repeat that? False I think she called it false grace. Um, it was posted, actually Dominique Maruso posted it on her web page, so it was fascinating. Um, I wanted to discuss a couple things that I think are relevant to this. One is that I think everything is um, in context, and um, Kim, when you were talking about the map and being able to have things, I talked about Emmett Till this morning, and by the way, two-thirds of my class at Lawrence Tech did not know who Emmett Till was. So, yeah, so um, just something, I've been teaching him for years at OCC as well, and um, Emmett Till was warned by his mother, when you go to Mississippi, you're in a different world. So even now, when we navigate the present, we're in different worlds, depending on where we are. I was in northern Georgia in a fellowship last year, and I was taking a walk in the woods, and someone had a Confederate flag hanging. And as a Jewish woman who teaches Emmett Till, it gave me the creeps. So everything's in context. Um, I also wanted to talk about when you, when I'm addressing Kim Hunter again, when you talked about killing the system, I disagree with that with all respect. I think we need to transform the system because we need to be working together. And King said in a letter from a Birmingham jail, we have a web of mutuality. And I love how he, I teach that letter, not at Lawrence Tech, but I love those first four words because he could have used great vitriol when he addressed his audience. And instead he said, my dear fellow clergyman. And I think that, and it's been addressed today too, I'm giving you a mouthful, but um, the oppressor and the oppressed both lose. It strikes at the very essence of our humanity. 
I wrote a piece last year and I talked about uh, John Michael Basquiat, the painter. When I found out he died at 26 of a heroin overdose and that his painting broke the American barrier for the sale of contemporary art, I went off. And I said to my students, and I repeated it this very morning, what has value? You. You are the most valuable thing in this room. Not your car, not your house, not your jewelry. You. And when we as Americans realize the great privilege that we're sitting in this room with fluorescent lights, I'm, as a single woman here, driving a car, vote, have a voice, I'm the one who has value, you're the one who has value, everyone in here. That's what I think we need to reconcile with. And when we get to that stage, then we have succeeded as a culture. I, I can agree with a lot of what you said, but and I'll try to answer that yeah. as succinctly as I can. And if I'm wrong, I want to know, because I'm my, often in, wrong. In, in my day job, <laughs> yeah. and, in my, and what wakes me up at 3.30 in the morning yeah. is that right now, we have 10 years to change this country's energy system yeah. from coal, gas, and oil to nuclear, to solar, yeah. sorry, that was a for answer, from yeah. to <laughs> solar and wind. And the people who did, the people who are responsible for that being the case knew decades ago that we were gonna have to do this. Just as the tobacco industry, there's two examples I use when I talk about American capitalism. The tobacco industry, I could talk about the auto industry too, yep. Yep. but the tobacco industry, those people smoked, they let, their, they let their children smoke, they let their spouses smoke, and they had, da they had uh, data for decades that said this stuff kills you. That's right. The oil industry, the, fu the fossil fuel industry is the same thing except it's on a global scale. Yep. In order to get the country, in order to, in order for humanity, and I know this sounds heavy, yeah. in order for humanity to survive, the system that allows those folks to operate is going to have to change so drastically in 10 years that no one is gonna recognize it. Or the alternative is, we all croak. But wait, I agree with you. So, 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 so when I talk about uh, being against the system, yeah. I, I, uh, and, and, and not using the, the mentality that got us here, we, we, have to, we have to completely, th that, where that connects to slavery is it values money amazingly, it values gold and power over humans. I agree. And, and that is such a fundament, that is so fundamental to the power base in this country. Yeah. You know. No, all I was taking, um, I was just using the word when you said kill the system, I'd like to see it transformed. I think we're on the same page. There's yeah. Yeah, it's going to feel like it was killed hmm. in 10 years. It's going to feel like that. I'm telling you, if, yeah. we, if we get there in 10 years, That's it's going to feel like it was killed. That's fair. And, and actually, it, I want to wrap it up because we have a few special announcements that we need to make at the end of this panel. But before I do, just on that point alone, I mean, to come back to this text, this is where that process of narrating a person from 1976 in antebellum slavery also is a resource for us because she's experiencing the feeling of being in another world and not just because of slavery. And this gets us back to the panel, the, I mean this talk series title, Humanity and Technology. This is where those two I think come together in really interesting ways, right? That other worlds, it's almost like traveling back in time, Butler is reminding us that other worlds are possible because we've already it's done it, right? And, but we don't necessarily know what it feels like, and the book pushes us to do that. And, and, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I also say, too, that we haven't talked a lot about the title Kindred, mm -hmm. and I think that those web, the webs of mutuality, the book does some really powerful work for just kind of seeing how far can you imagine that web, right? And, and, and what does it mean to acknowledge that web? Mm -hmm. um, so let's thank our panelists one more time. <laughs> And I want to thank all of you for coming. If you could sit tight for just one second, I'm going to ask Dr. Collins and Devante to come up right now. While they're coming up, I just have one quick favor to ask of you. See if this works. I am going to put a slide up here, if I can get my computer to come wake up, uh, that's going to have a URL. And if you could um, just plug that URL into your phone and fill out a survey for us, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, don't mind me. You guys go get going. I'll try to get this going by the meantime. Yeah. Okay. Yet.
Good afternoon, everyone. Just really quickly for the uh, high school students here, I noticed that there were a couple of you that had your hand up. You wanted to ask a, a quick question to the panelists. Did anybody want to ask a question? Thank you. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Something that I picked up while I was reading the book was actually how easy it was for Kevin and Dana to transition into this time period. So if we notice the story takes place in 1976, and although that is a few years back from where we are now, the fact that it was so easy to, for them to transition into the lifestyle of a slave and a master, I think that says a lot about where we are right now and how little we've actually come and how unlikely it is for us to acknowledge that shift. Because it, while we can say we don't have slaves now, we are uh, segregated anymore, there's still so much more we have to do in order for us to truly um, kill the system. And I'm not saying that kill the system. I'm like, I respect what you're saying about using the word transform because it is a little more inclusive, but I feel like that is so sympathetic to the idea that there was no problem at all. So I think that killing the system is a better way to truly say that there is a problem and we have to fix it. Because if we look at it like this and we say that we've come so far time-wise, it's not acknowledging the fact that we still have so many systematic things to take care of if we truly want to say that we have made a difference in our society right now, in our culture. Thank you. Can I respond really quickly? Or um, I really appreciate what you said, and, and as you were talking, I thought, you know, that's, that's actually, um, you know, an excellent way, that's a, I think that was a great exercise, right, to think about like, okay, we say killing the system versus transforming the system. If the system is slavery, right, do we argue for a transformation? And some people would argue that what, the, what you just said, right, some people would argue in their, and, and historians are, you know, debate whether, um, you know, slavery has just simply been transformed into like the modern, you know, prison industrial complex or if it's something um, distinct, right? But this idea that, you know, that, that the answer would be to transform slavery versus kill slavery, right? So I think that that's, that's a really important point what you just brought up, so thank you.